There you go. That's you. We're live, aren't we? <clears throat> Let's give it a couple of secs. Can I say a warm welcome from Table Tennis Scotland? My guests tonight are new and old, with one thing in common, and that is ping pong. Chris Duran is a TV star, but did you know he's also a table tennis player, a proper table tennis player as well. Juliet Johnson is part of the Johnson Trio, who have revolutionised ping pong in Scotland. Colin and Gav are old hands on the Monday night Zoom cast, and Matt will pick up your responses on YouTube. So we're um, absent with Mark Lumberg, and it is with great regret that I have to inform the regular Zoom cast members that unfortunately Mark's dad Eric passed away on Thursday. Now, Eric Lumberg was our biggest supporter of the Zoom cast, and he watched, every, never, never missed an episode. I did receive an email from Peter Shaw, which really sums up how we all feel. I'd like to read this email out to everybody, and then uh, in Eric's memory, we'll just simply get on with the show that he loved. This is from Peter Shaw. Uh, Dave has just told me about the very sad news of the death of your dad. I've known Eric since you were a bairn, turning up to tournaments. He was the perfect table tennis parent, supportive and involved, but never dogmatic or interfering. We shared quite a bit on the National Selection Committee, where I always enjoyed Eric's company. He had an easy manner and a great sense of fun. One of his great qualities was his ability to stay objective and reach fair conclusions whatever the circumstances, even when his decisions could affect his own son. As you know, that is a rare and honourable quality in a parent. A lot of table tennis lives have been enriched by his practical help. And you're just looking at Gavin Rumgate right now. And more importantly, in his example of how to lead a good and kind life. My deepest condolences and I'm sure that goes for everybody here so Mark all the best chin up and uh, we're all thinking about you right um, we're going to get on with the show because that's what we're here for and uh, the first thing I, I would like to talk to really or the first person I'd like to talk to is Chris and uh, Chris we've all seen him on telly as this TV star this ping pong player but he's actually a proper table tennis player. So, Chris, can you give us um, a brief? I'm told you it's impossible for you to be brief, but um, <laughs> if you can give us a brief auto of how you got started in table tennis, quick synopsis, and then how that led to you being a ping star. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks for that, David. Um, so the quick version, I'll try and be quick for the first time in my uh, table tennis or ping pong career in this regard. <laughs> Uh, I played real, converted real sports up to the age of about 10, 10 and a half, because that was how tail tennis was referred to when I first started playing. I didn't, re I had no tail tennis background as a kid. Um, and long story short, I had a very serious collarbone deficiency with the bone marrow in my right collarbone. So my collarbone was used in place for two and a half years when I was 10 years old, and I couldn't play any contact sports, or I was actually in, Engl in the England team for golf when I was 10. I was a golfer from the age of seven and I played county basketball, county tennis, things like that. So I'd never really even heard of tail tennis uh, properly up to that point. And uh, long story short, I had to be homeschooled for a while and uh, my dad had to take me out of the house when he went to work. He was a lifesaver and tail tennis was on the, the community sports one day and they put me there. And then after about 10 minutes, I would be in one of the players and they went, oh, how long has he been playing? He's like, about 12 minutes. <laughs> so that was... Uh, how I got into tail tennis, I was always quite a natural sports person. But yeah, so I started playing at 10, really, which was, you know, relatively late uh, compared to some people in the sort of elite national level tail tennis players. But that's really how I got started. Yeah. OK, um, I, I, I'm going to allow you to go a little bit longer because I'd like to know, um, some of our viewers don't know then that you've been in the top 10, you've played for England. So what's your highest ranking and uh, best result we'll just have? Uh, highest ranking in the seniors was three. Um, wow. 
a while ago now, a lot of people forget that. <laughs> Uh, that would have been in the 2010-11 season. Uh, I made my breakthrough. Actually, me and Gavin were training together that year in the 2009-10 season in Sheffield. And that was the first time I was ever, I was 18 years old. And I believe I was 16 in the men's when I joined in uh, September. And by Christmas, I was four or five. Um, I became like an athlete. I was fit. Um, I changed rubbers at the time from Steger to Tenji. Tenji was new on the market and I've, after I changed rubbers, I realized I was a bit better player than I thought I was. And um, I was playing professionally in Germany at 18. Um, I've been, I believe the lowest I've been ranked is seven since then. So from October 09 to the current day, I've always been ranked between three and seven. Um, so, yeah, that would be how I started playing on the top ones. And obviously me and Gavin had many battles in the Grand Prix in those days. So. So, uh, can I ask you then, how a current player who's ranked in the top seven um, has got involved in ping? Oh, God, well, I mean, me and Gavin, you know, we were opportunists, really, to be honest with you, in the first year. The first year was invitational only. There was no qualifiers. There was a very, um, in the nicest possible way, slightly amateurish, amateurish hardback circuit that was going around, but there wasn't really any... Uh, Barry Hearn, I believe, wanted a trademark with sandpaper. So in the first year, there was no real concept of sandpaper in the first year. And to tell you the truth, Fred, there was a bet Fred made with me against, um, oh God, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, back end, one of the ping pong players, one of the established ping pong players, basically bet me 50 quid at Blackpool Grand Prix that he'd beat me in a best of five with a heart, with a hard bat. And uh, long story short, I won three 0 and he wasn't very ha- uh, he wasn't very happy about it. A oh, Paul Paul Warriola, that was it. So I was blank on his. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> sorry, Paul, if he forgives me for that. So we had a best of five uh, at Blackpool Grand Prix in 2010 for something like twenty quid, I think it was, and I did beat him. And uh, then I won the Grand Prix the next day against Daniel Zwickel in the final from Hungary. So that was how I. So I had ping pong and sandpaper, and I was very fortunate in the first year. I made the semi final. It all went in a blur. I was in hospital for four weeks in the build-up to it, uh, at home on puree foods, and I was sleeping after every game. It was a complete fairy tale the first year. I believe Gavin got to the last sixteen. We were both knocked out by the by Soleil, who was just miles better than us in the first year. Uh, hey, Chris, right? I'll, I'll, I'll hold you fire there if that's right. okay. Right now, Judith, would you rather go next, or would you rather go after Colin and Gavin? Oh, I've just done muting. Um, I have no preference, so whatever you think will flow, flow best. But, um, okay, I'll, I'll put you on now. From Dundee to Alexander Palace to the York Stadium with Juliet Johnson. And uh, uh, people give me glowing reports about the sandpaper tournaments in Dundee, but I believe it's your son who got you involved. It's normally the other way around, isn't it? Yeah, it was very much Ian. Um, Ian's played table tennis like Chris from the age of 10 or 11 um, and played in the Dundee League, had some coaching from Gavin at one point when Gavin came back from Sweden and then went off to University in Edinburgh. And while he was in Edinburgh, he used to play a lot at Murrayfield and um, Charlie Ellis and Gordon and John Hanna and Gary McIntyre all got him involved in ping pong and he just got hooked. Um, we didn't really know anything about it because obviously he wasn't living at home anymore. And then um, he came, he was at home at the end of his fourth year at university with appendicitis. And he, he, he said, oh, I'm not going to be able to go to that tournament. And we said, what tournament? He said, oh, I'm going to a, a sandpaper tournament in Harlow in England. And we said, oh, well, you can't go. You've got appendicitis. So um, after he'd rec- got out back, back out of hospital, he said, there's another one next month. I'm going to go to that instead. And I was not willing to let him go and drive all the way to Harlow and play in a, in a effectively table tennis event. I didn't know any better at the time. Um, and so I said, well, I'll take you down. And that, that was my first exposure to ping pong. And, and it was an eye opener. I loved it. It was it was great fun. The atmosphere was great. The the social side was terrific, um, and it just all went on from there. He he played a couple of events that year. I saw my first ever high quality ping pong match, which just happened to be Chris Duran and Gavin Rungi. 
<laughs> uh, at the English Open in 2015, which was a real eye opener. And if you can see it on YouTube, go and watch it if you haven't, because it's a brilliant match. Um, Ian then won the Scottish qualifier that year. Gavin had automatic entry by having been in the top eight the year before. Um, so by winning the Scottish event, Ian got through. And he hasn't missed a year since. Neither have we. Yeah. So what, what, about I, 2018... I, I, gone. About 2018, um, up till then, the Scottish events had all been held at Murrayfield, um, by the, run by the Mules. And, but they were getting rather busy. And so they said, obviously, they knew us by then through Ian. And we'd been going down and playing Scottish events ourselves, even though neither of us are any good. Um, and they said to us, would we consider starting to run the Scottish qualifier? So we said, well, Ian loves it. So, yeah, we'll, we'll support him. We'll, we'll go for it. And so the last, we ran it December 2018, December 2019. But really all we did was pull together the core that Murrayfield had already built. There were already local, local fun events happening in Pennycook, Murrayfield um, and St Andrews. And we added up the number of people playing in those and it came to 55. And we said, that's nearly 64. If we get 64, we can have two qualifiers. And then if Gavin comes back, he might still get through. So, so that, that, I will admit, completely selfish driver. Um, and so we did a bit of promotion. We um, got, got some support from Table Tennis Scotland, letting us put stuff on the, the news and on the calendar, put some posters up at some Scottish events. Um, and we, we got up to 99 players played in a ping pong event in Scotland in 2018. So we got two places, which was lucky because Gavin didn't have automatic qualification that year. Though actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken. Gavin did, but oh, I've lost track. Yeah, anyway, doing well. Doing well. One, 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 the first year we did it, um, Ian and Gavin qualified, yes. It was the last year it was in Edinburgh, Ian didn't qualify, and he got in through the last chance saloon. Um, but yeah, the, first, the two years we've run it, we've had two qualifiers, and it's been Gavin and Ian both times. And that's how we got involved in Ali Pali. So basically the structure in Scotland is we have local events, which are mostly fun events principally, but with an added element for the players who take it seriously. The top four from each local event are guaranteed a place at the Scottish Championships, normally held the weekend before Christmas. Um, and then any spare slots are filled up first come first served. We had 30 in 2018 and we had 36, which is full capacity for wardrobe gym in 2019. 2020, of course, went completely by the, by the way, um, which is a pity because we were building up really good momentum. And I had several other clubs saying, maybe we'll hold an event next year and hopefully I won't have lost them now. Hopefully we'll, we'll get them back when it already starts. Uh, so that, that's what happened. It's all Ian's fault. Yeah, and also, uh, but just before I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to save you to last, Colin, if that's all right, um, is what I did find interesting that uh, Ian took it so seriously when he plays local league. He plays with his sandpaper bat, doesn't he? He plays with the closest legal bat he can get to a sandpaper yeah. surface, yes. Uh, yeah. And I think he started doing that, oh, I think it was before... I knew what he was doing. So it was probably around 2016, 2015, 16, he started doing that. I remember the first time he played with it in the Dundee League. He came in with this odd bat and Ian's best shot was his loop. He had, he had a really good loop. And everyone was saying, what's Ian Johnson doing with a hard bat with his loop? And, and then he went out and got very similar averages with his hard bat than he had with his um, expensive rubbers. So started okay. a few people. <laughs> Yeah, right, well, right. we'll talk about um, later on. Don't let me forget how Derek became the main man. He's the ah, main. Man. But we'll talk that... about in a bit if that's okay. So hold that, Juliet. Right. Um, and um, tell me whether I'm right, Gavin. Are you the only 
player who went to the World Championships, but in Budapest, but also played in the hard bat. Are you the only player to have done that? Who played in both the hard bat championships in Ali Pali and the World Championships in in Budapest? I'm probably the only one that's got absolutely a, no idea. Couldn't tell you, but I mean, for me, I was never fussed whether, you know, if a ping pong tournament was three days after a world championships, I would be there. You know, I'm so used to mixing between sports on a daily basis anyway, that yeah. whether I've prepared for an event or not, I'll be there. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but Budapest was great, wasn't it? Oh, Budapest was fantastic, yeah. Now, do you think, Gavin, that uh, you often, in the world of cricket, which I often compare table tennis to, the way it's gone five day, three day, 40, 40, 20, 20, do you see maybe in a and few now. days... Uh, and, sorry? But in the T10 now, in uh, <laughs> United Arab Emirates, it's... <laughs> That's right. Um, do you see maybe, I mean, you're a fit lad. We often say this on the Zoomcast, a uh, 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 bit like the Forest Centre forward at the moment, you know, he's very fit. Uh, and, and I see you playing good quality table tennis um, for a long time to come. But do you see a time when that you may leave table tennis to just concentrate solely on ping pong, just like a cricketer will stop playing tests to concentrate on the one day? Or have you never thought of it that way? Well, uh, I think I, I'll never I'll never properly leave table tennis because I enjoy it too much. Uh, yeah, I mean, difficult. I'll always have my club matches abroad. I'm contracted at the moment to play some matches in Germany uh, for the normal table tennis. So I think it's important to continue with, with that every season, trying to be involved in some sort of club abroad. Uh, and then I think with that, that gives me the motivation to practice every now and then. Uh, but for, for me, definitely, I mean, with the way the prize money for the ping pong is, and if, if the, the ping pong events are going you know, there's going to be more frequency to them, then I'm definitely going to make the transition more towards ping pong than table tennis. That's for sure. OK, well, we'll come back and, uh, and I'm going to get Colin to chip in uh, about Chris and about Gavin having been the commentator for them, <laughs> for them for, for so many years. But we did... Nice, make Colin. Yeah, we did mention this uh, a few weeks ago, but only if you saw the Zoom cast a few weeks ago. And I know technically the reason it's called ping pong, because I think America's got the copyright for hard bat, haven't they? Or something like that. Anyway, but what a lot of our viewers won't know is that Colin has actually won this event when I believe it was a lot harder because when Colin won the hard bat championships, there were still players playing local league and county table tennis with a Dunlop Barner. And so him, uh, Colin and Graham Sandley, for some unknown reason, I don't know why, decided they would play in the national hard bat championships, which all the hard bat players sniggered and said, well, just like they said about Ian, oh, well, Graeme Sandley and Colin both rely on spin. They both rely on service. This will be a great leveller and they'll get knocked out in the first round. The final was Colin Wilson and Graeme Sandley. Can, can you just give us that story again, Colin? And then, then I want you to talk about the inauguration of the, the ping pong because you've been... Oh, right OK, so if we're going to go back to prehistory... Yeah, pretty um, I was 22 and fit as a butcher's dog, just come back from Sweden and I was playing well. And uh, it was 1984. It wasn't the National Harbour, it was the International Club Harbour. So anyone that had played for England um, was conferred membership of the International Club. Um, and so anyone that had ever played for England could, could play in these tournaments. And they had an International Club Harbour championship every year and Graham and I got a little bit fed up because um, 
all of these stalwarts were saying, you know, you're good table tennis players, but it's not like the old day when you had to use guile and you had to use class and you guys just, like you say, just use the spin and the wrist and the serves and the deception. So Graham and I looked at each other and went, should we, should we just have a go? Just like, see if we can show these, show these old guys a thing or two. But you're right, is that they were playing with this the whole time. If anyone knows their table in history, the number one seed at the tournament was Stuart Gibbs. And this was back in 1984. So he was pretty, pretty good. Um, it was played at the Barnet Centre. Number two seed, I think, was Jeff Ingber. So these are, you know, if you go back far enough, I'm old now, but if you go back far enough, these, these people were, were icons of the hardback era. And, uh, and basically, um, I just opened the door after getting myself a drink and Graham had Stuart Gibbs pinned up against the back wall at, um, at uh, Barnet Centre, basically with his feet off the floor against the wall, just trying to chop. And Graham's playing with a £2.50 Tesco's bat. That's what he was, uh, that's what he was playing with holding it like a club and he was just like custard pies in the face like this. And, um, and so we played and it was, um, it was good fun. And we just about, you know, got the momentum going. Um, it wasn't a walk in the park. It's hard work, really hard work, but we kind of worked out a way through and sure enough, we ended up in the final and I decided to hit. Graham decided to hit, not chop. And, uh, and I went for loop off the bounce because with hard bat, there's a tiny little bit of um, tiny little bit more spin with the rubber. So I just I was just doing sort of top spin off the off the bounce, and I just beat Graham in the final. So yeah, I won the the international. It was all it's all it's all English players. It was called the International Club Hard Bat back in '84. Um, so that was cool. Um, I'm not sure we did it again. Actually, we just kind of proved a point. <laughs> I don't think you did. <laughs> and then and then and then carried on. And then. Um, and then uh, Fred, uh, Chris is talking about Fred. This is Fred Dove. So Fred Dove was the leading light. Colin, um, can I just stop you for two seconds? Mm. And I'm going to hand back to you. Um, you mentioned Stuart Gibbs. I just want everybody to understand that most people have heard of Chester Barnes and Dennis Neal. M m most people, even, even probably Chris and Gavin, who've heard of Chester and Dennis. Yeah, I'm sure you have. Uh, but that England team at the time was Chester Barnes, Dennis Neal, they would change order. And the, the constant number three was Stuart Gibbs. So Stuart had only just come out of being a full England international with a hard bat. Colin, you can now give me the history of things. Right. And it wasn't me that beat Stuart, it was Graham. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So hard bat was being kind of resurrected mainly out of Harlow and Fred Dove was the absolute superstar of getting it all going and getting, getting people along to events. So that was already happening um, 10, 10 plus years ago. Um, and then I don't know, maybe by coincidence, I don't know how connected it was. The lad might not might know. Uh, they had this world championship of ping pong played with a sandpaper bat, which Maxine Shmiroff won in Las Vegas in 2011. There was some argy-bargy over trademarks and copyright and the, the, the name ping pong and the type of bat. Um, but at the end of that, Matchroom, Barry Hearn's um, company, with backing of Sky, uh, decided to play a world championship of ping pong out of London at the Alexandra Palace, January 2013. And that's the event that Chris has told you about just now. And what was it? You guys were in the, basically in the quarters and semis and you've been in the 16s quarters and semis every single year since. And I just had the great good fortune to having been. Um, I was just before just before that, I was 16 in the world hard back. So I could still play reasonably, even though I was pretty old then. Um, but then just had the great good fortune to uh, to be offered the chance to do the commentary. So. Myself, I didn't enter it. Uh, Tony West, my co-commentator, entered it. I think he got to the last 16 one year. Master yeah. Gonzalez. There you go. Chris, Chris is amazing for, for, his, for his history yeah. and remembering. He's brilliant. Um, and, then, uh, and then after that, it was, uh, it's been Tony and me each year talking about, uh, talking about these fellas. So I've got quite used to, to talking about uh, Gavin and Chris because they do so well at it. And they're far better than I ever was. Just to put that in perspective now. Oh, yeah. 
Right, I'm just going to go back to Juliet, and and then, uh, as I say, the main man, it's not Gavin and Chris, it's Derek Johnson. So, why is he the main man, Juliet? Well, the players are the main men, not the officials. The officials are there to support the players, but um, putting that aside, um, as I said, we've been, Derek and I have been going to see Ian play at Ali Pali since the first year he played there in January 2016. Um, in 2018, no, 2019, um, there was a glitch with the, um, the, ref the referee. And so about a week before the event, they were phoning, Batchroom were phoning around trying to find somebody to take on the job of referee. Um, and they approached Peter Bayman, who's the English organiser, and uh, Peter couldn't do it. And he suggested me. And so they emailed me and I said, I'm not doing it. I can't umpire. I can't follow it. It's too fast for me. Uh, so I sent back saying, sorry, but 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 no, not that rule. Um, and then I told Derek about it. He said, well, I'll do it if they're stuck. So I emailed them again saying, my husband says he'll do it if you're stuck. And five minutes later, it was all official. Uh, so he went along, had really enjoyed it, enjoyed meeting the players more closely and being more involved behind the scenes, got on well with the match team room, match match room team. And that was it. He, he, he did it again the following year. Um, and then obviously this year we didn't have a world championships because of COVID, but he umpired the invitational event that they held the usual weekend which no doubt somebody else is going to talk about in more detail since you were all there and I wasn't. OK, I want to go back to Gavin, if that's OK, Gavin, because I'm sure a lot of people... You're playing abroad. I know this is the ping pong uh, night, but um, we're, we'll indulge in, in your club team. Um, are you tested? Uh, do you have to go into a bubble before your matches? And then I'm going to ask Chris about the bubble in um in in ping pong so can we can we just have your you're going off to play in germany gavin and what is the protocol at the moment well as of 5 p.m tonight the season's been cancelled oh. so, <laughs> so that's that yeah. uh, we've played i've played three team matches which has resulted in six individual matches and i've won four and lost two so so far so it's a decent level and the players in my team are very strong sometimes I'm playing at number two sometimes I'm playing at position three uh, but there's four players in a team and if you're playing at one and two you play the opposing one and two if you're playing at position three or four you play the opposing three and four and because of the the COVID restrictions this year there wasn't any doubles and normally the match hinges on the double, so it can't be a draw. Yeah. So, so when you arrive, are you tested, or is it quite? You know, what 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 do you? I tested it at the airport, or, or well, what? the last time I played a match was in November, so things have probably changed now. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Uh, I just had to, you know, some of the declaration put a little bit of information when I got back on the flight. Uh, from Dusseldorf back to Heathrow. But but that was all. During the matches, we still had a, a crowd at that stage. Wow. And everyone was, was wearing masks. And if you weren't playing a match, you had to get masked up as well. Yeah, yeah. And did you play with separate balls? Or did, did, did like, when you serve, you played with one ball? And then you, no, you played with the same ball. So you could have, yeah. That's it. Symbol, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and um, and we're playing quite well, Gavin. Or, or do you think, damn, you know, we've not been able to practice as much as I normally would? He's quite pleased with your own standard. Yeah, I mean, sharp enough. I mean, I think you know the strengths in my game, the serve, the receive of serve, are always there, whether I'm practicing a lot or not. Uh, my only practice partner, really, in the last well, since since March, has been Neil Cameron. We've yeah. practiced maybe 10 times in the last 10 months. <laughs> so that's been my practice. Uh, and I practiced four times with Ethan Walsh for the ping pong just before we went yeah. to the Masters. Yeah. Right then, Chris, if you can tell us about... First of all, I'm curious to know how many balls you hit before, um, before the ping pong. Were you, 
were, were you just dedicating yourself to the hard battle? Were you trying to keep your standard up, even though there's no table tennis being? So let's have um, a year a year with Chris. Duran. A, year, a year with Chris, uh, Doran or Duran. That's an interesting year. Yeah. And uh, Gavin will tell you the truth that I haven't been a full time player since 2011 in terms of training um, full time. And it's caused some very aggressive arguments in the Belgium League and French years over the years with people not believing that I'm training five times a week because similarities me and Gavin that the type of players we are you know generally competitors and his strength being in serve and receive and my strength being sort of my natural hand feeling and let's say my tell intelligence as opposed to speed and repetitive of shots I don't necessarily need to train as much as some players but I still should train more um so in the pit, lead up to the ping pong, I wouldn't say I practiced a ridiculous amount, but the quality of the practice I had available was the difference. I, me and Bagley only lived 25 minutes apart. So, I mean, Bagley is the best ping pong player ever as it stands. You know, he's won four world titles. And um, I shouldn't dismiss him as well. Um, he and Juliet's son, you know, me and him became really good friends through the ping pong. We only lived 15 minutes apart, 20 minutes apart. So me and Ian, I think, played twice and me and Bagley probably played about seven times so I only had about nine sessions but the set nine of the nine sessions I had were very elite players as was Gavin's with Ethan's but you know playing with the seven times at Bagley is like playing 20 times with nearly everybody in the entire world with the exception of four or five players and that's no disrespect to Ian but you know you play with Ian and then you play with Bagley and it's the level is so high you know and you never misses a ball basically so you have to work for all your points and then when you went to the ping pong masters, when you played even the people in the caliber of that field, you feel like you've got extra time because the ball is a little bit slower and less quality. So I didn't necessarily play a great deal, but I did. And I tried to eat well and be healthy in the build up to it. So I felt in good shape going into it. Relatively. I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing that you know Chris says he played seven times with with Andrew. You know, the first two after the first two times, Andrew would get rid of most people because they wouldn't be able to keep up with him. So how does Chris do it to keep up with him from a standing start against the world champion to get the second and third and fourth practice with him and then seven and then he's he's pretty much ready for the championships? I mean, both Chris and Gavin are amazing at going from a standing start or out of practice to a high level in what is minutes. It's a little bit like they said about Ayrton Senna and Michael Schumacher. Mm. They may not have been loads quicker every lap, but what they did, they got, they, they managed to win pole position by a thousand. Um, and then on the first lap, they pull out a second. And after 55 laps, they win by a second. So just that ability to, to, to come straight out of the block and be world class is amazing. Froze. Have I, have I froze? I personally I didn't notice anything, David, on my end. I thought you were fine the whole time. Yeah. Now you have. <laughs> okay. no. But no. No, I appreciate well, that, Colin. Um, he's with Colin's answer, that was all. Well, yeah, both. No, it was back again. Both marginal of you. differences, Colin, make a big difference, you know. I mean, Gavin had probably, in my opinion, his best ever ping pong tournament, and he was one point from going out to Matt Wett. You know, and that. Uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, Gavin. Yeah. Well, that's the worst. That's the worst thing you can do is uh, is get one point from winning against Gavin. Then you're guaranteed to lose. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. You know, Gavin was one point away from losing to Matt, and Gavin was the fifth seed, and Matt is, let's say, the sixteenth seed, something like that. And then the next round, he beats the guy that's beaten the three-time world champion. He beats him reasonably comfortable three-one. So. You see with these small moments with the very top players and, you know, in this instant, Gavin. Gavin has probably got about an 85%, 90% win ratio in a 50-50 environment at 14 up. You know, it's remarkable what he's done in that regard. And you just saw the composure from Gavin at 14 up. I mean, yourself on commentary, you said, I'm pretty sure Gavin's going to flick this ball and Matt's going to look for the ball. So Matt is probably thinking the same thing. Gav touches short to the fore and Matt's half a second late and then Gavin can guide it down the line and Matt's one away in the ball is the composure at 14 all that probably only a couple of people in the field are capable of doing really no. we've got a couple of questions oh, oh good. Dave oh, come good. up yeah yeah Matt so first Cole. yeah so first one's for Gavin and it says um uh I'm gonna have to um 
Uh, to paraphrase this one. Uh, Gavin, why do you go for the double point ball earlier than anybody else on average? Right, I want to hear this one as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably a little bit like Ronnie O'Sullivan in the snooker. If you're, if you're a good front runner, you're, you're better getting ahead. So uh, I just I just feel more comfortable with a, a nice, fast start. I mean, I, I think I would be a little bit more tight at 12 all to take a double ball. By then, players have got used to my game. They've got used to my serves, potentially, by then. Uh, I just think it's better, like a greyhound out of the blocks. You, you're two or three points up, take your double ball, basically set over by you know, a minute into the first game. Mm. So that's, I've, I've always stuck to that tactic. Uh, I think I got it right in the semi-final of the Masters there against Bagley as well. And I had a phone call with Bagley a couple of days later. We were on the phone to each other for an hour. Good chat. And he said, yeah, you stunned me early on. The double <laughs> ball. You know, he said, I'm just not used to anything like that. He said, and you're, you're just a really tough competitor. Yeah, well, the, 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 the most logical thing there is that Gavin believes, and I've not done any match analysis to prove it, but Gavin, I think people think that Gavin wins um, a higher proportion on his serve than most players do. And I guess people are less used to it earlier in the match. So uh, get, get yourself on a roll, play with that freedom. Other people are not so used to you. You're using the double point ball always when it's your serve. So, yeah, get on with it, get ahead and maintain that freedom, I guess. Yeah, there's an incredible amount of spin, or, or may, maybe not so much the spin on the ball, but the way that it reacts off the opponent's racket. Mm. Sometimes that can be even more exaggerated than table tennis. Players over the years have those thousands of hours of getting used to certain spins. You know, some of the players that haven't practiced with me in the ping pong if I, if I use one or two of the serves I can almost guarantee they will miss that the first time and and then that's why you would utilize the the, the double ball early on I feel almost it's it's a banker for a two points just to get you comfortable at the start of the match yeah so that was Ian Rind that uh, that asked that one Good and stuff. the other one the other one really well, quickly say on that that I was yeah. I don't necessarily 100 percent agree with Gavin if you look at my matches, well, I'm using them a lot. Right. Six balls. Let's cross in Rind. In Rind. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you looked at the matches I played this year, I was using them at like six five, six four a lot of the time. And I agree with Gavin. If you leave them to 10, 11, 12, the win percentage is definitely less than 50%. Because the <laughs> server feels like they have to win the double point ball. So like I don't like having a set plan on the double point ball, whereas I know a lot of people have an absolute set plan. We wait till 11 or 12 and then we take it. Whereas I, I like to go halfway between Gavin and the, the set rule. I tend to go by feel on it. It's like some of the players as well, halfway through matches seem to get dementia as well. They, the half, half the players I've played don't use the double ball. And I, I've never understood. Well, well, Sadalek being the famous one, that was incredible. Yeah, well, he's old enough for dementia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. And the other question was, um, can playing ping pong help develop your table tennis game? Now, before I come to the, the lads, I'm going to ask Juliet to unmute and see what son Ian, who I've seen train and train and train at Corby Smash with Tony West as coach, um, and he's played tons and tons and tons of ping pong. Um, what does Ian think about the effect of sandpaper ping pong on his table tennis game? Um, we have obviously discussed this. Um, and Ian's view is that it has improved his table tennis because as a young player, he didn't have a, he didn't have a lot of touch. In fact, you could possibly say he didn't have any touch, and he now has. Um, and touch really generally is something you can't learn easily. So if it's managed to get him from very little touch to quite a decent touch, 
I could probably do it for almost anyone. Yes, he does work hard, but that's because he's not not really a natural player, unlike Gavin and Chris and the other top players who all laugh at Ian because his table tennis stand is so much lower than his sandpaper standard. Um, but it, it's because he, he concentrates on it and he works really, really hard to overcome he does. his... He's an uh, he's amazing trainer. Talent. He's an amazing trainer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, and Gavin okay. also gave us his view on that, but I'm sure he can give you that himself. Yeah. So what do you think? What do you think, Gavin? Can what, What's ping pong done for your table? Is, it, is there any transference? Is it zero? Or is it positive, negative? Are there different things that, that help and hinder? I mean, if, if you're a... If you're a winner, you'll you'll be a winner in, in ping pong. I mean, that's uh, I'm sure if the likes of Paul Drinkle was to take it up and have two or three solid months of only playing ping pong, I think he would be quite good. You know, maybe not the the first year at one of the big tournaments, but certainly you know in year two or three. Uh, but for me, it's more. I think it's helped. It's helped me progress my table tennis as well position wise a lot of the times now in, in the ping pong I'm just playing position to then play a forehand next and ironically in the ping pong I've got probably 30 or 40 percent more power than I do in table tennis as well <laughs> uh, so maybe back to the tennis days I've been able to hit out of the ball a little bit having just that fraction more time in the ping pong possibly that uh, but no, it just it simplifies your tactics down the the ping pong. Uh, play to an area and then play a next shot to another area and then you're well ahead in the point. And then when you come back and play table tennis, a lot of the times the, the positions just take care of themselves too. Right. And how about you, Chris? What does... What, how does sandpaper help your table tennis, if at all? I mean, just quickly going back to what Julia said, I, I'm lucky that Ian is now arguably like my best friend in the ping pong or table tennis world because, you know, he's moved to Silverstone, Northampton. So we've actually talked about this a lot. You know, how does it affect, you know, each of our games? And I think the biggest difference for me is the fact that as a player with relatively less power in the table tennis game, I completely agree with what Gavin says that you actually have to hit the ball at ping pong. The, you'll have some days in your ping pong training where you'll play an even player. So me and Gavin, let's say me and Gavin were playing ping pong and I'm having a slightly off day, Gavin could absolutely crucify me at ping pong. It could be like 15-3. Because if you're not hitting the ball and your timing's off with a ping pong racket, it will just drop off. I, I mean, me and Gavin have never had that scenario, but I was just using that as an example. Mm -hmm. Whereas at tail tennis, you know, the I've rubber will give you an element of security. So what will happen, and I'll use Bagley as the prime example for this. So Bagley always wants to do a crash course sponge training immediately after the ping pong. He normally takes a week or two ah. for the body, and then he trains hard afterwards. And he is crunching the ball at the start. And he's actually a more, he's a better tail tennis player because of ping pong. You know, he's probably a better example than myself because he plays more. But he goes from, he was relatively safe. He was afraid to miss five years ago, six, seven years ago, at Sponge at his level. But now he crunches the ball in training. And I said to him, mate, if you played like that way in pro tours, you'd be easily top seven in the world, easily the level he plays at in training. And I just wish he would do that more in Sponge. And I do the same thing, but, you know, occasionally vice versa. I remember playing a Belgian league match a few years ago and I was off the table fishing and I tried to hit a backhand topspin and I completely forgot that you have to use your wrist in Sponge. And I hit like a full lock back end and the ball hit the wall. <laughs> so yes. it does occasionally have its ups and downs. But yeah, I'm, like what Gavin said about winners, for me personally, it takes about five hits. And then I feel like I can play again. You know, yeah. a week or so, you're not ideal. But if you're a winner, you find a way to win on those bad days when you come back into sponge after, after sandpaper. Okay, great. And last one, I'll pass back to Dave. So it's Colin Green that asked, uh, can playing ping pong helped develop your table tennis game. And I just texted back, because I had a second, uh, and I said, I am certain of it, used in the right way. So this is a kind of a coaching thing. And I said, it's excellent for biomechanics, movement, and timing discipline, and weight transference. All of these things trans transfer positively to table tennis. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Gavin. 
Yeah, that's that's spot on. Uh, and and again, because you maybe just have that little bit more time in the ping pong, you can develop a lot of those attributes as well. So that sometimes at table tennis, the ball's kicking through. You're worrying about a little bit too much of the spin coming from your opponent. You then maybe forget to transfer if you're a right hander onto your left foot as you rotate through the shot. Ping pong, there's less going on. The ball maybe bounces a touch higher, and and over time you maybe gain gain that confidence to to then start to step through and hit the ball. It's a bit like I suppose in in when you're maybe a minor or a cadet and you go to some camps and they throw in some of the shadow play. Everyone looks reasonable at the shadow play. Then you introduce the ball again and, you know, your game deteriorates. So, so yeah, that's, that's spot on what you were saying, Colin. Right. Are there any more questions? Nope. That's it. You were back to you, Dave. Yeah. Colin, if I lose internet signal, if you can just take over. Okay, just like old days, that isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Um, both, both of you. Um, I'll start with Chris first. Do you think you've reached your peak at? Uh, if this question's been asked during the time I was off the internet, then then just have you? Do you feel you've reached your peak at ping pong, or do you think there's still more improvement there? I'm going to ask Gavin the same question. No, I don't think I have reached my peak. I think that, one, you can never think that way in competitive sport. Um, and specifically in the ping pong environment, you've got to remember that it's still a relatively new sport. It's, you know, eight years old. Um, you know, in eight years, I've made seven quarterfinals or better. So I've been the model of consistency without winning a title, you know, a World Cup or a World Championships and if I'm being perfectly honest, I feel like I possibly should have won this year, the ping pong masters, or at least been in the final, you know, with um, Bagley being slightly injured in the final, that, you know, it felt like the winner of me and Bag uh, Fleming would have probably been favoured going into the final. And I feel like I let something go there. And, you know, part of it was tactical. And I rewatched the match back that I made some tactical mistakes after 2-0 and um, at a more obvious level that I wasn't, I'm not the athlete that Gavin, especially Bagley and Fleming, Ah, so from a physical standpoint, I know I haven't beat. Um, I've lost um, one and a quarter stone in the last two and a half months, 10 weeks. So I am losing weight now. Um, I, I, in my world, I did with the ping pong would have come about two months later and I would have, you know, I've you know changed my diet now and I'm getting fitter. About eight years overdue, unfortunately, in my case. So, but I think... If you look at Gavin this year, Gavin was certainly hitting the ball 30, 40% harder than I've ever seen him play before. If you look at the way Gavin serves from all over the table, he adds a dynamic to his game. The way I play, you know, I'll hit some balls, I'll chop some balls, I'll hit backhands, I'll turn around and play forehands in the backhands. So you give different variables. So in terms of maybe thin for the ball, I might have peaked in that regard because there's not that much you can do with a sandpaper racket, but I could certainly hit the ball a bit harder. I could play four hands a bit more. Um, that was the main problem that happened against Fleming. And um, okay. ideally, I'd, yeah, just, um, I'd probably play with some more players as well. Yeah. Gav? Uh, you've reached yeah. your peak or think you're getting better or have you sort of hit a, a level? I thought a couple of years ago I was starting to lose the plot and getting worse. Mm -hmm. But this year, no, there was there was a big step up, and possibly that was because practicing with Ethan Walsh, he hit the ball quite hard. He had quite a strong forehand and backhand. So if I just played right on the wings, he was destroying me. So that that got me hitting with someone, you know, with that sort of pace. Then when it came to the tournament and I played Bagley. I felt like I had more time. He wasn't hitting the ball as hard as Ethan Walsh was. No. Uh, so that was possibly one thing. Uh, but I think all the top eight to ten players, they come back, and I feel every year at the Ali Pali, everyone's moved on five or ten percent each year. 
So I think it's natural that everyone year on year will improve a little bit, but have you improved as much as the other players? That's that's the question. So so yeah, I think we're all understanding the game, but it does take a few years. It does take, you know, seven or eight practices year on year to develop your game. Right. Um don't ask Colin. I'm quite curious at which question shall I ask him. Can, can you <coughs> just move away from the table tennis side of things? What, what explain how the bubble worked when you again <coughs> when you got to Coventry? Did you all have to go in a hotel for two weeks? Did you? What, can you just run through? Right. Okay. So the 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 possibility of running of running this tournament. Um, was because of basically Football Premier League. Uh, there was an agreement between Football Premier League and the government at fairly central high level quite early on to say, you know, if, if we're in lockdown, then, you know, everyone's stuck at home, can't do anything. Should football players do the same or, should, or do we want to get Premier League matches on and give the people stuck at home something to enjoy, something to look at? So they conceived this, um, this concept of the elite sport bubble. And that elite sport bubble in football actually covers uh, Premier League down to National League North and South, just underneath the EFL. Um, and they're all operating under this elite banner. It meant that um, elite sport could happen in a few other sports and uh, World Championship of Ping Pong got the same uh, designation. So uh, ba basically, I was lucky. I'm only an hour from Coventry, so I got to, to drive to Coventry. I was in the car park. Um, I had all sorts of forms and Gavin and Chris and, and uh, Ian and Derek would have had the same, uh, all sorts of forms. They were really impressive. I thought in the, in the, in the, in the lead up to the championship sky, sky TV, they've been amazing with their protocols. They've got people out on outside broadcast, but mainly working from home. Um, lots of roles were done from home by the experts um, despite the fact that we were running live from a venue. Um, so that was all cool. And then um, when you, uh, when you get, you got to fill out a survey, you got to answer a load of questions. And then when you arrive, you immediately check in at the hotel and immediately you're behind glass and you are ushered safely straight into a medical room, one of more than one. Um, and you are tested um, immediately from there. You are basically marched to a hotel room and you're locked in your hotel room until about four or five hours later when all the tests got driven to Heathrow. I don't know why Heathrow or an area around Heathrow. Um, so to drive them all the way down there, do all the tests. And then only uh, as only when the test is negative, do you get a phone call to say you can now leave your room? Even when you do that, I might see Gavin, I might see Chris, I might see Ian and Derek and the others. Um, but still, still masks, still two meters, still sanitized everywhere and, um, and quite regimented. Having said that, you are in a bubble. And I just thought this is like being you're in a hotel and you've got a major venue. You've got the, the floor all kitted out with all the lights and everything. And I just thought the environment was like being on the, uh, the bridge of the Starship Enterprise because you can't leave. But it's all high tech. And that's what it really felt like. But it was great just to get out. And put from a personal point of view, I'm sure everyone would feel the same if they had the chance. It was great to see old friends and say hi and actually be in within seeing distance and, and talking distance, even though you've got the protocols. But at least knowing that everybody is tested negative in the bubble. And then were you allowed to leave immediately the tournament ended? Or were, did you have to... I mean, when I had my COVID no, you, last week, I had to sit down for 15 minutes and before I was allowed to leave. No, that, that they're, they're just checking you to make sure you're, you're healthy. So yeah, we could, we could leave. Um, but few people left straight away. People, people did relax afterwards for a bit. And uh, I stayed overnight. We were, we were, we were allowed to stay until 10 or so the next morning. And, uh, and people from afar were, were put on flights. I just should say that to me as well, extra day, they had a, Brilliant for a matchroom or Sky, and it was matchroom or Sky. They actually had a doctor on site, a medical supervisor. So we had to be tested every day, um, temperature. So it wasn't like you got tested on the Thursday and they left you alone till Sunday or Monday. You were tested every single day with your temperature. 
And if you ever had any questions or anything, he was always there to ask. So, Colin, there's been a couple of questions. Can do, do you want to read them out? I, I saw yeah. one up from Roger again, Roger Close, and another one from Gordon Muir. Yeah. So I'll go for Roger's question. Would ping pong be a better spectacle if players used corneo tacteo bats? You would never get players just dropping the ball down off the bat. It would be a better advert for the game. Well, I don't know about Corneo Tecteo specifically, um, but there's our question. Would it be would ping pong be better if you played with a Corneo Tecteo bat? I'll just get one of you to answer that. Gavin? Couldn't tell you. No. I, all, all, all I know is I had a lot of very positive phone calls after the tournament, uh, either from Matchroom Sport with the viewing figures being up on every other world championship uh, previous and uh, people that I knew just saying, wow, okay. And some of them don't know table tennis at all. And they said the game is just very watchable. Uh, lots of longer rallies. They can see the difference of the height changes during rallies as well. Someone hitting the ball very low, someone going mid-distance, someone hitting the ball a bit higher. Uh, all of that seemed to come across very well. There's a few, right. few there's a few questions here, Dave, but there's something I, I've already responded to Roger on this one. I think uh, uh, a, a corneo tecteo bat um, actually would be uh, counterproductive. Um, and the, the point is that a sandpaper bat is basically, what it's basically about is low friction and no rubber. A cor even a corneo tacteo bat is rubberized. And therefore, you get, you get dwell time, you get spin. And ru um, rubber is the antithesis of low friction. Ping pong works because it's low friction. Because the sandpaper, or despite its name, is very, very low friction. Um, as soon as you introduce any form of rubber, they will vary. People will treat them. You'll get higher grip. And then the principle is destroyed. Um, however, I think we should use a bat. I mean, all you need to do is get, well, here's a sandpaper bat. Um, and that's what they use. And that's nice and hard. You can hear it. At the same time, you've got a modern rubber bat. plays like this. Um, and all you'd need to do really is just to rip the rubber off, just just pull the rubber off and play with the blade. I mean, it would be, if you had the right kind of blade, it would be the same. The sandpaper does nothing. You could just play with the blade uh, because it's all about having no rubber and low friction. And those are, those to me are critical elements. Okay, Gordon Muir, Colin, what did Gordon have to say? So Gordon, 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 no, Gordon noticed that there are a lot of nets so the, the ball traveling low over the net, hitting the net a lot, and and that had an impact. I think there was there's a specific thing and a general thing. The specific thing was that the net was, and Juliet will know this from a referee's point of view, uh, the net was a little bit slack and they tightened it as much as they could, but it was still a little bit slack. So when the ball hit the net, it tended to drag and go on the table. Um, I think it would be better in sandpaper because the margins over the net on average are, are lower um, in terms of, you know, your options with the trajectory. Uh, my view is you would have a very, very tight net, like a guitar string, top string on a guitar. So that if the ball does hit the top of the net, it's more likely to ping up and off rather than for people to get lucky and for it to go on. And that's, that's just my uh, opinion. on it. I don't know if anyone else has got that. So um, maybe there's more chat about that. And then I'll come, I want to come back to a question from Johnny Cowan at the ICTF. Okay. No, no, I'm happy with that. If you take the Johnny Cowan question, because I've got other questions to ask Gavin and Chris. All right. then. So Johnny says, as uh, world table tennis comes to life through tough COVID times, players, fans and entertainment are all central to the strategy. What elements of ping pong events would you all like to see in table tennis? Good question. Thanks, Johnny. <laughs> wow, who wants to take that? Chris or Julia? Oh, no, I wasn't volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, OK, I'm going to start just to give Chris and Gavin thinking time. 
certainly the, the whole presentation of ping pong is just fantastic. Yeah, um, it's just so you get people talking about it and surely table tennis can can learn from that. Um, I, I One of the questions that, not quite what John is asking, um, is 11 points right? It's 11 point, it's 11 point match, is that right for ping pong? And is that right for ordinary table tennis? If I, if I can add that. Now, does anybody want to pick up on Johnny's question, which was loaded? Chris or Gav? I'll, I'll just go quickly because the you, you basically covered the basics of what I was going to say, that if you look at the presentation from the ping pong, that you have Sky that have such a successful career, they know what they're doing. They, they have a good atmosphere with the guests coming in, for example. You know, players, why not get them in as guest commentators? It adds a new dimension. I don't remember that barely ever happening in table tennis. It, I mean, if you have the same commentator all the time, it kind of gets a bit monotonous, even if you are the best commentator. And if I was being hypercritical of table tennis, sometimes if you compare the professional of the sky compared to Eurosport, for example, you'll set the record for Eurosport on the table tennis and then you'll miss them. They just miss it. You know, it's half an hour late or something, things like that happen. Uh, you watch a whole thing and then suddenly the TV rights go and then the semi-final comes around and it's a five-minute video. Um, you know, I've got three years' worth of recordings Ooh. of the ping pong on my Sky TV, hours and hours on end. And similar to what Gavin said earlier, you know, I've had friends that, just my old school friends that come to the ping pong every year because they love the atmosphere. Why not have a beer in the crowd and enjoy it? I, I do feel like Sometimes it's a very genetic response, but you get the sort of stuffy old crowd in Telfness that like things a certain way. <clears throat> you have to change as the time goes on. Yeah. I, 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 I don't want to embarrass Colin here, but Colin's the best commentator. By, I think if, of all table tennis, anywhere, I, I don't know anybody who commentates better than Colin. And, and all the feedback I get, you know, people who don't know Colin to say, Colin, he, he, but you know, no matter what, what Colin does on the commentary, I, I think he does it well. Whether it, it, it's, uh, I, I think that is a big help. I think that is is, is a big help. Is, I've, is al well. I've already I've already wired it to your account, Dave. That's just, just, <laughs> just don't just don't tell them about my 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 drug use and multiple marriages. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, now now for the for the boys. Um, when you go on to play, it's almost really it's a two part question. Are you just as nervous or, or as when you're playing table tennis? We call one ping pong, one table tennis. And then secondly, what is the best match you've ever played in? Your most memorable match, ping pong. So first of all, I'll go to Gav. Are, are you nervous when you go on? Are you just about the same, would you say, on the arousal curve more than when you're Okay, you're playing in Budapest, you're playing at ping pong. Tell me how you feel nerve-wise. It absolutely varies match to match, day to day. Played Bagley there, I didn't have any nerves whatsoever. Played Matt Ware, I was a little bit nervy because the hall was absolutely freezing. and I had my North Face jacket on right until five seconds before my walk-on. So I was nervy there because the temperature was so cold. So again, it, it just depends on the day how, how you're feeling. It doesn't necessarily mean it's because of a particular opponent or a particular sport or whatever. It just depends on that day. Yeah, but I was also wondering, Gavin, is normally when you when you're playing table tennis, um, the world championships it is not live on television or it, it's it's not you're not even on television probably some of your best ever matches where you know you're playing in front of several thousand spectators does, does that cross your mind at all or do you just revel in it nah. all, all, all i care about is the the winning that's that, that, a bit like Stephen Hendry in the snooker. Yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not particularly bothered whether I play well or play badly. It's. It's just get the win, uh, and get into the next round. It's. It's always been like that since I was been a minor under twelve right up till now. As long as you get the win, that's the important. 
Okay, if any of our young Scottish players are listening, I know we have, have a good audience. Can you take note of that? That Gavin's not mentioned, oh, the door opened and therefore I couldn't concentrate or, or there was noise in the background or somebody opened a bag of crisp. He's just focused on that event. TV cameras don't bother him. Nothing bothers him. And he gets on and plays the game. Good coaching lesson for everybody tonight. Right, Chris, nerves... I compare the two. Oh, I'm not asking you best match. Best match will come next, Gavin. At nerves, Chris, compare the two. Again, I agree with Gavin almost completely that if I take the ping pong, just isolate as an example this year, I felt no I felt no nerves. I was asleep half an hour before I played Makutis in the last 16 because uh, I didn't want to play too much and I was completely relaxed. Makutis is a fantastic chopper and you absolutely destroyed him, Chris. I appreciate that, Colin. Um, no, I, I kind of that was a very specific match because you don't have too many defenders. And um, in, an, in another argument, point for another day, I do actually think that is a market where if you've got a truly world class defender that could attack as well, they would be incredibly difficult to have beaten at the ping pong. Uh, it's just finding the balance, but that's a story for another day. But when I played Sorensen, um, unlike Gavin, it wasn't the cold that got to me. I just the draw was kind of opening up a little bit that some of the harder quarterfinals on paper weren't necessarily me. And everyone was telling me, oh, you're in the semis, you've got Fleming. Or, and it, I don't know if it was the expectation or just the fact that I was favourite, but I never felt comfortable in that game uh, until sort of halfway through the third set when I started to open up a little bit. But I was tight in that game. Um at the ping pong, it's happened a couple of times that you sometimes you do feel great and sometimes you don't. Just so many factors, to be honest with you, Dave. Um, what the only thing I will say quickly on this is for many years I listened to very pump me up music before a match, you know, things like you know, Show Must Gone by Queen or like a really big song like that to really get in the mood. And Bagley told me something about three or four years ago. I said, How, how I asked him this very similar question. He said he doesn't listen to anything before a match. He likes to just chill and relax. And he literally, you'll see the video on Sky, he'll put his feet up before the match. Um, so I if I found if I did that, I was too anxious. So what I've done now is I listen to more calm music before a match and I find like a balance between the two. And that seems to have evened out my nerves a lot more before matches in the last year. Okay. Gavin, best match ever in ping pong? Ping pong. Uh, not, not in terms of playing uh, well. But it, the uh, not necessarily your best win. You, you've yeah, come away exactly. from that match. You might have won it, you might have lost it, but your most memorable match. Memorable would be playing against Paul McCreary last year because I would never have lived that down if I'd lost that quarter final. Uh, so probably that one. Again, Paul was probably playing at 80%. I was probably playing similar. Uh, we could have both been a bit better. But just in terms of getting the job done to get that World Championship medal. Uh, and again, it got to that stage where I've lost the first set. Um, 14 all, so I'm match point down in the, the second. I'm just not even thinking about that. At that point, mentally, I'm thinking, this guy is so far away from beating me. Uh, so again, in the big moments through my career, it's been able to be very positive yeah. mentally. So, yeah. so that that has to be the best one for me. Was was that moment against McCready last year? Yeah. Most memorable match, Chris. I mean, it's cliche, but I mean, I have two to answer. Beating Bagley in the quarters is the obvious answer. You know, I I'd, I'd played with Fleming for a week. Uh, I think it was six days in Germany before, and everyone felt slow. I just it was it was like I was seeing the ball on a beach ball, and you know. I played Sadlek before in the warm up, and I think I've been about 15 2. Played Matt Ware, I was being 15 2. And then when you play Bagley, and you know, th those were training sets, but then when you go on and you play Bagley and you're beating 15 8, 15 7, and you're exactly two points better than Bagley. I mean, in the nicest possible way. I don't think that's been done before in ping pong, where, you know, people have beaten him, but they haven't really done like that. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of neutralise each other's stars a little bit, being two more back-end orientated players. So, you know, what he, he catches a lot of people out of his back-end down the line when they're turning. But, you know, I don't turn so much. So 
it wasn't necessarily as effective for us, which meant in a scenario where he'd normally been a winner, the red ball was coming back at him. And um, that was my best performance. And probably the match I was the most proud of was playing Yang Wai Hao, the ex-world champion from China in China in the World Cup. Um, I think I was eight love down in the first set in about two minutes. He was just killing me. And then Bagley said, you know, you bit Bagley was like, just need to defend and get more balls on the table and try and grind. And I was 1 0, 14, 13 down and saved two match points and I won the game 2 1. So it, even though I played better against Bagley, to say that you fought against the world champion from a position where you were getting pretty badly beaten is um, that was maybe my proudest win and my happiest with Bagley. Okay, right. Juliet, the best game you've ever seen. Or do you want Colin to go first to give you time to think? Oh, best game. Most memorable game was, as I said earlier, the 2015 English Open match between Chris and Gavin because it was such an eye-opener. The best game I've ever seen, I would say probably the final between Bagley and Fleming in 2020, January at the World Championships. I was on the edge of my seat for the entire match and I didn't know who I wanted to win. Wow. Uh, okay. It was, it, it was just phenomenal. I thought, Juliet, I thought, Juliet, you were going to say when we played against each other in the, the qualifier <laughs> in Edinburgh. I tried to forget that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I won one point. <laughs> that was very kind of you. <laughs> Colin, uh, the most memorable match you've commentated on in, in ping pong. Yeah, OK. Um, there's been so many, but there's one that sticks out. I mean, Gavin has been to 14 all and held us on a cliffhanger and come through so many times. So those are a series of moments. But I'm going to have to return to exactly the match that, that Chris talked about when he played uh, Bagley in the quarters. It was, it was stunning. It was electric. It was art it was class it was a a demolition of the best player we'd ever seen by chris doran outclassing and for 20 for about 20 minutes bagley was just on the ropes and chris was just pummeling and pummeling and pummeling and whatever bagley threw at him um chris was just outclassing the best possibly the best ping pong player that had ever lived and I said from my little cubicle, not the toilet, I was doing the commentary. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, behind, behind the glass with, with Tony, um, what I said was that that is the best period of ping pong that anybody has ever seen. And I think that stands to this day. Good. OK, now I want a quick answer because uh, I'm going to put Gavin on the spot in an emotional way in a minute. Um, Going back to Johnny Cowan's question, do you think if table tennis went one point when it got to the decider, would you like that? 14 all, next point wins or whatever, 12 all, when you got to the deciding end, or do, or do you like the two point cushion? A quick answer, uh, Chris. Oh, sorry, table tennis. Um, I would like it every set apart from the last set. I don't like it in the ping pong in the fifth set. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. I, I don't like Bagley Fleming, the best match ever being decided on one point at 14 all. But that's just that's just me. Yeah. Okay. So so you, you prefer the, the, the two cushion? I wouldn't a decider. Oh, but, I wouldn't but, mind it in every other set, but I feel like in a decider you should go to. But that's just my that's just me. Okay, Gavin. Yeah, it could be could be similar. I think the scoring system is perfect though. That the double ball chucked in a couple of times through a match. Fifth, up to 15 is good. So you've got between the old stuff being up to 21 and the new stuff being up to 11. That So 15 bridges the gap either way if you were from the 1950s or you were from 2000. So I think I think they get it right. Yeah. And Juliet, what, 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 what do you, are you quite happy with? Um, the well, obviously I'm not a player, uh, but... I feel that the difference between the scoring systems in ping pong and table tennis is like you were saying about the cricket at the beginning. They're, they're partly good because they're different. Yeah. And I think if table tennis did the same thing, um, it wouldn't be as exciting. 
And to me, ping pong's more of a, a, a 2020 and table tennis is more of a test match. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else agrees with that at all, but as a non-player, that's my view. Okay, right, um, we've come to the end of this, but I'd like to finish how we started. Um, and, and Gavin, can you just give us your, um, your lasting thoughts of uh, our dear friend, Eric, and his influence on you, Eric Lundberg? I know you wanted to say something, and I think it's only fitting as our 14 times champion, the man who got you playing table tennis, the man who took a back seat, never took the credit, um, what has he meant to you? Send my condolences, you know, to, to Mark if, if you're watching this tonight and, you know, obviously to the extended family because uh, I, I got the, the phone call last Thursday from Mark and obviously that was quite tough. Uh, and, yeah, Mark, Mark was a, a great friend, still is. Eric, an incredible guy who used to drive me to many of the tournaments uh, through the years. Uh, getting a wee bit emotional actually thinking about it now. Uh, but well, yeah, uh, he was just a, a great guy that, you know, there's no one could say a bad word about Eric. And he progressed my game no end when it could have just been his, his own son that he favoured. Uh, I felt Eric was just a, a very fair guy very fair to my mum and dad and my sister as well. Uh, and just, just sad that, that he's passed. Yeah. Okay. And don't worry, he'll be, he'll be watching from above. Look, I'd like to, I'm going to get Colin to close the show. Uh, we've slightly ran it over time, but well, that's not bad. Uh, but have you got any burning things, Juliet, Gavin and Chris, you want to say? And I'm going to ask Colin to wind things up. Uh, have I go first? Um, I'd just like to say um, ping pong's great fun, great spectator sport. And if anybody wants to host a tournament in Scotland, just get in touch with me and we'll help you out and lend you equipment. Fantastic. Right, Carl, I'm going to, as the commentator of all this, uh, you can close the show officially. Okay. But are there questions before you do? Have we missed any? I don't think so. I think the. Um... The, John, John, Johnny's question about world table tennis and the, the things they can learn. I think there are there are a few really key things that are not obvious that we can learn. I'll pick them up another time. Happy to talk about it. Um, um, but I think for me in general, I'm viva la différence. If we get into discussions about table tennis is better than ping pong, ping pong is better than table tennis, then we're just cannibalizing ourselves. We're just eating into our own flesh. Table tennis is absolutely fantastic. Ping pong is absolutely fantastic. They are different. A lot of people might say there's not that much difference. It's still played on a nine by five table with a table tennis ball. Um, but, you know, we know that they're different and there are some real qualitative differences the way it looks to people who are not table tennis experts on tv so they're different and i think we should embrace both forms of the game so if i'm going to give you a ridiculous analogy part of the problem for table tennis this it's got very few it's got very few medals of very very small medal availability and therefore not much funded you compare with swimming i'm not saying we can solve this problem but in swimming you dive in, swim to the other end and get a gold medal. Then an hour later, you've got another sport called swimming there and back again, which is someone dives in, swims to the other end, swims back again. You get a different medal for that one. Then you get another sport called a four, another four of swimming. You go in, dive to the end, turn on your back and come back on your back instead of on your front. You get another medal for that. And then you swim down to the other end. Chris Sims swims down one end, gets to the end, and Gavin jumps in and runs to the other end. You get another medal for that. So swimming doesn't have any problem with accommodating different forms of the sport and having them all, both and all recognised. We should recognise both. We should love both. We should encourage both to flourish. I would love to see ping pong events at table tennis tournaments and, vi and vice versa. Um, and I think, there are, I think there are further variations of the game that we should embrace. And one of them for me 
would be uh, would be table tennis with the net raised. And if you find the, and and the argument against are the rallies going on too long is that if that happens, then you gradually you gradually reduce the net and it never goes back up again. So you actually you actually organize it so that the net comes down if necessary, but starts a little bit higher. And then we get more Applegren and Gruber type games for those for those that remember those sorts of players. Um, but I would go for both. And I think there are some absolutely critical reasons why ping pong is is uh, is recognized so well as a spectator sport and table tennis has got some uh, work to do. I'll, I'll talk more about that another time. But, OK, well, a big thanks to uh, Juliet. Thank you from Carlisle and a big thanks from Gavin, guess in London and Chris in Milton Keynes, roughly, and Colin in Corby. Have I got you all about right? Yeah. yeah, yeah Northampton, well, a bit closer now. And, and thank you all. Lots of good questions. Great night. And we'll see you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>